So last weekend, I just had my first drum clinic. That is my first drum clinic where I was on the presenter side of the stage and not just in the audience. And honestly, that's not been something that I ever thought I would do or I planned to do. It wasn't a goal at all. So thanks to Drummer Co. for inviting me to do this event and for organizing everything and making it happen. It's honestly still a bit surreal. Like, did I just do that? I guess that happened. A lot of my friends, when they heard about this, they were telling me, oh, you'll be fine. You'll do a great job. It should be a piece of cake because you do these YouTube videos all the time. But it is so different. It is super different when I'm just in my own comfortable studio talking to a camera and I know I can just stop it and retake if I lose my train of thought or I say something wrongly and I can edit out strange pauses when I stumble over my words. But to be in an unfamiliar environment facing down more than 70 drummers and not only having to talk to them but to play music for them that is a completely different experience. I've actually never played drums as a solo instrument before an audience on my own. It's always been behind a band, so that was a completely different experience. It was pretty terrifying, as I've been telling everyone that asked me how it went. It was a great experience, but also very scary. As much as I felt intimidated and that being able to do this was completely beyond me. I also knew that there are many newer drummers out there who would feel also intimidated to even come to a drumming event because they don't feel like they're good enough or they just are not comfortable. They don't have drummer friends to go with. And I know that because there are people whom I've talked to that feel that way and I was there before. It's It was just something that I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing at an earlier stage in my life and I wanted to have a clinic that was a little bit more accessible to anyone. And so I did ask the audience how many of them were there for the first time, and this happened. How many of you have never been to a drum clinic? This is the first time. So yeah, that was majority of the audience who were at a drum clinic for the very first time. For me, that was a big win, and I think I managed to accomplish what I hoped for in just getting a lot of newer drummers out to come watch a drum clinic and I hope you guys will all continue to attend more such events and just get more involved in drumming even if you feel like you might have just started out. I did record somewhat bootleg footage of the whole clinic more for my own reference and archival but I will not be posting the whole thing here. I was really nervous and I was nervous rambling a lot so I tried to cut out some of those sections where I was just going on a bit much. Plus, I also want to keep some of the clinic as just stuff that went down in that location. And it's something that is a bit special for the people who are there in person. Even just the playing of songs, there's something different about being there in person to be able to hear it versus just seeing a recording of which there are so many online. So here is a slightly truncated version of my first drum clinic. I'll put a couple text labels to describe the sections we're in and also give you a summary of the parts that I cut out. And that's about it. Enjoy. So when I was thinking about what to share in this drum clinic, I started thinking about the clinics I had attended in the past. And many of them were by international artists. Sometimes when bands come and tour in the region, 
their musicians will also host the clinic. So if they have a concert in the evening, maybe they'll teach a master class in the afternoon and then do the concert, something like that. And honestly, there were times in my life where I couldn't really understand what was happening in the clinic because whatever happened just went straight over my head. I didn't really understand what the person was sharing. But no matter what level of experience and skill I was at as a drummer, the one thing I could appreciate about any clinic was when the person was talking about their story and their experience. And I think that's something that resonates a lot with me personally. I love hearing about the process behind how someone got somewhere versus just where they ended up, right? So I find that process very interesting. And that's what I want to share with you guys today. Basically, my story of how I learned this wonderful instrument. And I'll be sharing that through a series of songs which will each represent certain seasons I was in in my life, what I was learning, and then I'll talk about some concepts that I was working on in those periods of time. And they're also just songs and music that I love. And I just want to share it with you guys because that's what it's all about, right? We just love music and we love being able to create music with this instrument. So that was a really huge thing for me. And if there are any of you here who are taking drum lessons or, or maybe you're just learning on your own and you haven't yet played with someone else, I really encourage you to find a band to make music with because that will push you to grow in completely different ways. So when I was in that CCA, I, was, uh, I had to learn a lot more songs. And one thing I had to work on in order to be able to play those songs was speed. And I think all of us can relate to having to learn to play faster because the fact is, if a song is at 150 BPM and you can't play at 150 BPM, you can't play the song. There's no way around it. And um, when I was thinking of what song I could share with you guys to um, represent this phase of my drumming life, I remembered this one song that I struggled with a lot because it was super fast for me at the time. It was about 180 something beats per minute. And I really struggled with playing that. I actually went to dig up the video of me playing it from like 13 years ago. And when I looked at myself playing it back then, I, I realized that I was super stiff and awkward. And let's just say my technique was a real work in progress at that point of time. You might have realized there were a lot of fast snare fills in that song, which were played with single stroke roll, right, left, right, left. I think that's the rudiment, the first rudiment most of us would learn. Um, and the interesting thing is, back then, even though I feel like my technique was really, really a work in progress, I didn't actually have a problem with that single stroke roll part because that's what I thought speed was back then. Like, if I could play fast singles, I could play fast. But the part I struggled with was the part that looks a bit like this. I couldn't play this on the hi-hat at that speed. So instead of playing the verse beat like this, I had to simplify it. I was just playing just one note instead of two, right? I was playing quarter notes instead of accented eighth notes. And I was kind of moving with my whole arm really stiffly because like I said earlier, I hadn't figured out how to move my wrist and control my wrist to make those dynamic accent strokes. So the thing you can take away from this, um, sometimes drummers think they're playing fast when they can play a, a single stroke roll fast, but that isn't necessarily the only thing you need to work on in order to play musically. It's also important to work on your dynamics, your control of loud and soft notes, and that can often help you to express a song a lot better. Or my take on technique is that it's something that you need to continually reevaluate at different stages of your drumming career, right? So if you're starting out the first few months or even the first few years of drumming, maybe you don't need to think too in depth about your technique yet because if you're totally new, you're getting used to this instrument, trying to learn what everything is called, you're working on your hand and foot coordination, you don't need to think in great detail about technique yet. Whatever technique you're doing that feels natural to you, as long as you're relaxed, you're not hurting yourself, that technique is going to get you to a certain level in your drumming. But with that initial technique, there comes a time where you feel like you're kind of stuck. And if there's some of you in this room that have played for a little bit longer, I'm sure you can relate to this feeling where you're trying to do something and you just, you just hit this barrier and you can't go beyond it and the rate of improvement seems to slow down. A lot of times, it's our technique that's holding us back. And when you reach that kind of a plateau, the question you need to ask yourself is, can I play everything that I want to play in music 
with my current technique? And if the answer is yes, you actually don't need to do anything about it. But if you feel like, in order to express myself musically, I want to achieve something that's beyond that, it might be time to relook your technique. So one thing that I saw some of my colleagues doing on the drum set that I wasn't sure about how to do quite yet was playing these little quiet notes on the snare. Um, I'm sure someone knows what these are called. Someone just shout out, what are the soft notes called? You guys are awesome. I'm going to give you a hand. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so yes, those are ghost notes on the snare. And at that point of time, I wasn't really sure where to put them. And everyone was just like, yeah, just toss in some ghost notes. And I'm like, OK, how, what, where? Because no one really taught me about that. So how I learned ghost notes was by studying this book called The Code of Funk by the drummer David Garibaldi. He's the drummer from this uh, famous funk band that was really big in the 70s called Tower of Power. And the book was basically just a bunch of his transcriptions of songs. And I just took one of those songs, I chose the one at the slowest BPM, and I just took one bar at a time, one beat at a time, figured it out note by note. Because it was his transcription, he notated all the little ghost notes there. And I just slowly pieced it together. And then after I learned a couple of songs in that book, I kind of reverse engineered the logic behind why he was playing the ghost notes where he was, and that was how I developed my ghost note vocabulary. If you were listening and paying attention to the groove and fills in that song, there wasn't that much happening. It was literally all on this side of the drum set. I didn't touch this drum, I didn't touch this drum, I didn't touch anything here. And there are genres of music where most of the song is just holding down the pocket, the groove, or just playing the drum beat, hats kick and snare, there was no chorus on ride cymbal. There was no big crash cymbal moment. And sometimes newer drummers feel like the more they learn on the drums, they need to, to hit all the things. And every time you go to a new section of the song, you need to change to a different sound. You need to play a fill every other bar. And I just wanted to show you guys a song that didn't have all those showy elements and is still really fun to play. And so one thing I learned from funk songs like this was how to just enjoy the music. So the saddest thing for me is when I hear drummers say, ah, oh, this song is so boring. It's just the same beat for the whole whatever section. And that just breaks my heart, right? If you are bored playing the groove in a band for an audience, isn't the audience going to be super bored? They're not doing anything. They're just sitting there watching you. It's such a privilege to get to be a part of the music. So from playing songs like this, I think I learned a lot about paying attention to other things that happen in the music and just enjoying those moments. So at this point of time, I will take a drink of water. <laughs> you can applaud my hydration. really appreciate the interaction, by the way, guys. It's like super scary talking to a bunch of people. And I have not actually spoken to this many people probably since like the thank you speech at my wedding. My, my husband is over there, by the way. He's my drum tech. That's why, you know. <laughs> OK. So I decided to play a Rush song. And like any good drum student, the first thing I did was go to Google, and I typed in free rush drum sheet notation transcription. Yeah, I know you, got, you guys have all done that at some point of time when you're trying to figure out something, right? So I found these PDFs of rush songs. It's quite excited. I'm like, OK, I'm going to learn these songs of music that I enjoy. Sat down at the kit. I was looking at the score, tried to follow along. A couple bars later, I realized the score was horrifically inaccurate. The fills weren't lining up. All the ghost notes were missing. It was like useless. So long story short, I ended up learning Rush songs by ear. And I would just take the track and slow it down. And I remember having to slow down some fills to 25% because I really couldn't figure out what was going on. And I would literally just count the number of hits I was hearing on every drum and then try and total it up and see if it made sense in the bar. So it was, it was a very painstaking process. But that's the next milestone in my drumming that I want to talk about today because learning a song by ear in detail is one of the best things I ever did. And that's how I really in improved my vocabulary a lot. And a lot of my students are here, so they will tell you that I always tell them, don't trust this, the scores, don't trust the notation, you have to use your ear. 
Even if I wrote the chart, don't trust it. Because there is a lot of nuance you cannot communicate through just notes. For example, just open hi-hat. We write it as a circle above the hi-hat note, but do you open it 2mm, 3mm, 5mm? How fast do you open it? When are you supposed to close it? How hard do you hit it? All that is information we don't get from just a drum score. You actually need to listen to it and figure out how you're hitting it. And a lot of times in fills, there are subtle accents. So in drumming, we usually notate accents and non-accents. But in music, you don't just have level 100 and whatever a non-accent is, level 10. There's all the in-betweens. Those things don't get communicated in a score. So if you guys haven't done it before, I highly encourage you to learn relatively complex pieces of music just from listening. I think you'll grow a lot. So this song I'm going to play for you is not YYZ, I'm sorry. But I'll be playing Subdivisions. And Kevin, our MC, was asking me um, earlier why I chose this song, even though it's not the most popular um, Rush song. So two reasons. One, the name Subdivisions is kind of hilarious to me. It's such a drummer name. Because Subdivisions are another name for note values. So our quarter note, eighth note, triplet, sixteenth note. But in the song, they're using it to talk about divisions in society and prejudice. So it is a pun. And I think that's such a lame drummer thing to do, so I love it. The, the second reason is this was actually the song that was the first cover I ever uploaded on my YouTube channel. So it is a special one to me. I have never played this live in my life at all, so you guys will be the first to see it. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. That was Subdivisions by Rush. And there were actually a bunch of time signature changes in that song. There's places where you basically don't count to four. And I'm sure if some of you were just listening to the melodies and following along with either the vocals, guitar, bass, you might not even have noticed that there were time signature changes happening. And that's the beauty of these kinds of songs. I have one more song for you that has a lot of time signature changes. And uh, this one is a Dream Theater song. At that point of time, I firmly classified Dream Theater as songs that I enjoy listening to but will never ever play. Because at that point of time, based on where I was in my drumming, I completely couldn't understand anything that was happening in terms of the drum parts. It was just beyond me. I couldn't understand anything Mike Portnoy, the Dream Theater drummer, was playing. I just enjoyed it. At that point, I hadn't started playing any double pedal. So I have a bass drum pedal on my right, and I have one on my left foot as well. And back then, I hadn't started on that, didn't know anything about it. So Dream Theater songs, for me, were impossible to play um, about 12 years ago. And this, well, it took me a couple of years of practicing before I first figured out my first Dream Theater song, maybe in five years after that, after graduating. But this song in particular that I'm going to play for you was still too difficult for me at the time. I did try it, and then I gave up. And honestly, about two weeks ago, I was still undecided if I should try it, <laughs> because it, it is still kind of difficult for me. But I'm just going to give it a go today. And it's definitely not to show off, because uh, I'm not confident of nailing it 100%. And the reason why I'm doing this is more to remind myself that there was a point of time in my life that this was completely unfathomable. It wasn't just impossible. I couldn't even understand anything happening. And now it's something I can understand and that I can attempt. And so similarly for all of you here, I want you to just take a moment to think of something in your past that maybe was impossible for you, something you tried to play when you started out that seemed like it was super difficult, but now you can do it. And just take a moment to appreciate your own progress because I think a lot of times we just beat ourselves up about not being good enough for this and not being good enough for that. We forget to appreciate that we have actually progressed in our journey as drummers. And then think about the things you're trying to do now that seem impossible. Maybe it's a song you want to learn that you're stuck at 80% speed or a certain technique that you haven't mastered that just seems like you'll, you'll never get it, you'll never be able to do that. And remind yourself that if you could do that first thing, if you keep at it and you don't give up, you'll be able to do this second thing as well that you guys are working on. So that's going to... I'm really scared about this one, you guys. <laughs> but you know what? You're all drummers. You're all family. I'm just going to try it. 
And my message to you is whatever you think is really difficult and impossible, just go for it anyway. So I at least will be supporting you. So, yeah, okay, I didn't tell you what song it is. Let's see if you guys can just yell it out. What is the Dream Theater song that's an instrumental with way too many time signature changes? We got it, Dance of Eternity. Thank you so much. That was literally the hardest thing I've ever done live. But you know, I'm always telling my students, you gotta go out of your comfort zone if you wanna grow. And I have to lead by example, right? So I hope you guys keep challenging yourselves. All right, so I just have one more song for you. I need to catch my breath. I have one more song for you before we go into a short Q&A session and one more drumming milestone to talk about. And that is not gonna be a cover song, it's gonna be an original song. That is the next huge milestone that I wanna talk about because learning covers is great when you wanna expand your vocabulary and all that, but when you're put into a, a situation where you actually need to come up with drum parts and you need to listen to music that doesn't have drums in it, and you need to think about what would the best drum part to put on this V, what would be an appropriate drum part, it's a whole other skill set and it works your brain in a very different way. So again, if there's some of you who have been playing a while and maybe you've done, you've played in cover bands but you've never written your own music, I also encourage you to try that at least at some point of time in your life. I think writing original songs also changed the way I learned cover songs because before that, when I learned how to cover songs, I was just basically copying what the drummer did and figuring out what they played and then I learned how to play that, which is fine. But after going through this process of actually working with other musicians who are not drummers and coming up with stuff from scratch, now when I look at covers, when I try and figure out drum parts, it's not just about the drum parts themselves. I'm actually trying to think about why did the drummer play this? Is he trying to do some interesting pattern on the drums or is he responding to something in the music and to me, it's always way more interesting to figure out why someone did something rather than just what they were doing. So this song that I'm gonna play for you is off um, Efficient Public Transport's first EP. It's on Spotify and whatever streaming platforms if you like that kind of music. And I hope you'll be able to hear very clearly, I think, in this one, both the funk and metal influences in the same track. So this is Eden by Vision Public Transport.
you. And um, so that basically was a summary of how I learned to play the drums. And I never actually took lessons. I didn't go for lessons, but now I'm a drum teacher. And it's funny how life works that way. But you know what? There's really no point in comparing ourselves with others because life isn't a competition and it's not an A to Z thing. We all have our own starting points and I believe it's up to us to also create and find our own form of success. So my wish for all of you is that you will also continue to improve, continue to try and be the best version of yourself, which is what I try to do. So before we go on to the Q&A section, session section, both correct. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Thank you to Singapore Drum Shop for providing this really nice DW Collector Series Kit, which is actually the first time I'm playing a full collector's kit. So it's pretty cool. And thank you also to 16-Beat for providing the drum heads. These are Evans G2 clears on the toms. We have a G mat on the kick and Evans UV2 on the snare. And I'm playing Promark Firegreen forward 5As. So thank you to Diodario for having me on their roster as well. So with that said, I think I'll let Kevin take over for hosting the Q&A.